Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis resuming our bleeding and coagulation playlist. In this video, we'll talk about coagulation groups. We have three groups. We have the fibrinogen group, we have the prothrombin group, and we have the contact group. With that said, now let's get started. Please, please, please watch the previous video on coagulation factors before watching this one. Now let me answer the question of the last video. Which coagulation factor is the most heat unstable factor? Oh, the answer here is... It's literally called the labile factor. Why it's labile? It's heat labile. So what is the labile factor? Actually, believe it or not, it's factor 5. And whenever you think of factor 5, remember two unstables. It's unstable on heating. It's also unstable during storage. Coagulation has four steps, vasoconstriction, primary hemostasis, secondary hemostasis, and fibrinolysis. We are done with vasoconstriction and primary hemostasis. Today we're talking secondary hemostasis. We are still here in physiology. In the next video, we'll start talking pathology. We'll talk about hemophilia, vitamin K deficiency, etc. And then I'll hit you with pharmacology, heparin, warfarin, thrombin inhibitor, factor 10 inhibitors, etc. The coagulation cascade is best understood from here. You start here and you go upward. You start down. Okay, fibrin. This is the goal of the freaking clot. That's why we call it fibrin thrombus. And then don't forget to stabilize the fibrin using factor 13. Okay, fibrin came from fibrinogen, genesis of fibrin. Okay, how do we go from here to here? Thrombin, the protein of thrombus. Where did it come from? From prothrombin, prethrombin. Nice. And how do we go from here to here? You need not just one thing, but a complex of four different substances. Two numbers and two words, five and ten, calcium and phospholipid. And then you have two stories to activate factor 10 into the 10A and then continue the cascade. You have the extrinsic pathway story and the intrinsic pathway story. Extrinsic pathway story, we need tissue factor, also known as tissue thromboplastin, also known as tissue phospholipid, also known as TPL, also known as factor 3. Factor 3 will activate factor 7 into 7A and 7 will activate 10 into 10A with 5 and calcium and phospholipid. They form the prothrombinase complex, prothrombin into thrombin, fibrogen into fibrin, stabilize the fibrin, boom, you have the freaking thrombus. However, there is another story called the intrinsic pathway story. We need something from within the vessel, such as the subendothelial collagen. We'll activate 12, 11, skip 10, 9, and 8. So literally, this is 8, 9, 11, 12. Cool. Factor 8 needs vulnerable brand factor as a carrier and a sustainer and a half-life prolonger of factor 8. And then it activates factor 10, and you know the rest of the story, right? We have compared between the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway in the previous video. Remember, extrinsic, it's shorter and it's less efficient. Intrinsic, it's longer, but it's more efficient. How do we measure intrinsic? The longer PTT. Because the pathway is longer, you measure it with the longer word, A-P-T-T. But this is short, you measure it with the shorter word, only P-T. Another crazy mnemonic. How many letters do you see in A-P-T-T test? You see four letters and we have four factors. We have eight, nine... 11, 12. How about PT? These are only two letters and we see two factors. We see factor 7 and we see factor 3 which is the freaking tissue factor. Coagulation factors or the clotting factors. Are they proteins, fats or carbohydrates? They are proteins. They are plasma proteins. Okay, are they albumin or globulins? They are globulins. Okay, are they alpha globulins, beta globulins or gamma globulins? They are freaking beta globulins. Source, they came from the liver. All of them? Yeah, except calcium which is factor 4. Factor 4 is ionized calcium. It does not come from the liver. Nomenclature. Each factor has a name and a number. The name denotes the function or the disease or the patient who had the disease, case in point, Christmas disease or hemophilia B. Number. Each factor has a Roman numeral number, as you see here, but there is no such thing as factor 6. Some students will say 3, 4, and 6 don't exist. These students are woke. Only six doesn't exist, but three actually exists. Three is the same thing as the tissue factor, and four does exist. This is the freaking calcium. Function of these coagulation factors, they are proteolytic enzymes. Oh, but you said that they are proteins. My man, there is no contradiction whatsoever between being a protein and being an enzyme. In fact, all enzymes are proteins. Ha ha. They are proteolytic enzyme. They catalyze proteolysis reactions, which means breaking down proteins, and that's why they activate each other, and we go down the cascade. 12, 11, 9, 8, activate factor 10, and then with 5, we activate prothrombin, which is 2, into thrombin, then fibrinogen, which is 1, into fibrin. Boom, boom, that's a cascade. Proteolytic enzymes. Here is the number of each coagulation factor. Here is the name and here is the function. We have talked about this in the last video. Remember, here is labile factor or factor 5 or proaxillerin. 
It's a cofactor, it's the most heat unstable factor in the freaking world. My beloved student, please do not forget that fibrinogen is factor one, prothrombin is factor two, tissue factor is factor three. How about factor four? This is the calcium. Factor five is here next to factor 10. How about factor six? Doesn't exist. Factor seven is in the extrinsic. Eight, nine, 11, 12 are in the intrinsic. 13 is stabilizing the fibrin. Oh, medicine is so hard. It doesn't make sense. Oh, shut up. I'm joking. So here's the number, here's the name, and here's the clinical syndrome. These 12 coagulation factors are divided into three groups, the fibrinogen group, the prothrombin group, and the contact group. To understand this better, I'll take you back to my previous video on serum versus plasma. You take some blood from the vein of the patient and let it sit, let it simmer, as Gordon Ramsay might say. And then red blood cells will go to the bottom, hashtag gravity plasma will be on the top. And in between, a very small, teeny tiny layer called the buffy coat containing white blood cells and plated. Sometimes it appears green because the main white blood cell, like numerically speaking, is the neutrophil. And neutrophils have myeloperoxidase and myeloperoxidase is green. Then you leave the blood. Do not add an anticoagulant to the test tube. The blood will clot. No kidding. And then watch the plasma separate into serum and the freaking clot itself. The clot contracts, releasing the serum. Clot contracts, releasing serum. It gets smaller, 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 shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. And then what's left on the top is the serum. So literally, the serum is, look at this word, it's amazing, defibrinated plasma. Oh my goodness, this is profound. It's literally plasma without the fibrin clot. Mm, love it. So technically, serum is plasma minus the clot specifically the fibrin clot. Serum is literally plasma without fibrinogen and without factor two, factor five, or factor eight. Serum or sera, it's a clear fluid, okay, and it has high concentration of serotonin, and that's why we called it serotonin in the first place, because it's abundant in the serum, the protein of the serum. Technically not a protein, but an amine, but who cares? Serum versus plasma. The main difference is that serum cannot clot. Oh yeah, because you took away the fibrin from me and the fibrinogen. Yes, and factor two, which is the prothrombin, and you took factor five and eight away from me. However, plasma can clot because it's still containing fibrinogen, factor two, which is prothrombin, five and eight. Serum is the remaining plasma after coagulation, but plasma is the blood without the blood cells. And of course, this is before coagulation. Serum has no clotting factors. Plasma has the clotting factor, including fibrinogen and others. This is a generalization. I don't mean all of them, like mainly fibrinogen, prothrombin, five and eight, not all of them. Okay, cool. No fibrinogen in the serum, there is fibrinogen in the plasma. No prothrombin in the serum, there is thrombin in the plasma. Anticoagulants are not needed for separation. Absolutely, because you should not add anticoagulant if you want the blood to clot. And when the blood clot, it will release the serum. So serum preparation does not require adding anticoagulants. How about plasma? Yeah, we need anticoagulant to make red blood cells here at the bottom and plasma here at the top. Since plasma forms first and then the clot forms and contracts releasing the serum, plasma has a shorter preparation time. However, serum has a longer preparation time. Don't forget the main difference. Plasma can clot, but serum cannot. Whole blood, when you take a whole blood from the vein of the patient, it contains blood cells and plasma. The blood cells are basically red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets together in a green buffy coat and plasma. Cool. After this, buffy coat is white blood cells and platelets. So basically whole blood is red blood cells plus white blood cells plus platelets plus plasma. Let the plasma clot and it will give you coagulation factors in the clot. Do you mean all of them? No, 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 all of them. We have the fibrin, and the fibrin came from fibrinogen, so this is factor one. We need prothrombin, this is factor two, because prothrombin will be thrombin, and then fibrinogen will be fibrin. What else do we need? We need factor five, and we need factor eight. And then you're left with clear serum without the clot. Here is blood, here is whole blood. It's made of plasma and surrounding the plasma is blood cells, including RBC, platelets and white blood cells. Inside the plasma, we have the serum and we have the clotting factors. Do you mean all the clotting factors are out of the serum? No, 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 not all of them. Only the ones that contributed directly to the fibrin formation. So we have the fibrin, which is not a factor. We have factor one, fibrinogen, this is a factor. We have factor two, which is prothrombin and we need factor five and factor eight. These are the factors that are not in the serum. And these are the factors that are not stable in storage. So if you're not available in the serum, you're not suitable during storage. 
Remember five minutes ago when I told you that five is the labile factor? It's unstable with heat and it's unstable during storage. Why? Why not? Because it's literally outside of the serum. If you're not in the serum, you're not stable during storage. So here's the phrase that's going to make history. Serum is defibrinated plasma. The fibrin fibers of the blood clot has been removed and separated from the serum. What was in the fibrin clot? We need fibrin, we need factor one, two, five, and eight. If you have watched my previous video, the third question in this playlist was, I've told you that blood coagulation in vitro happens due to the intrinsic pathway activation, which is absolutely correct. But how come we can clot using intrinsic pathway outside of the body? Who's going to activate factor 12 if there is no subendothelial collagen? Because now this blood is outside of the body. Here is the deal. There are other things that can activate the intrinsic pathway, i.e. factor 12, 11, 9, and 8 other than the sub collagen. And these things that will activate the intrinsic in the test tube include high molecular weight kinetogen, calicrin, platelet factor 3, and the wettable surface of the glass, which is negatively charged. This will activate the coagulation cascade, especially the intrinsic pathway. And that's why if we want to add an anticoagulant, we also need to make it not wettable. We usually coat it with silicon to act as an anticoagulant to prevent the activation of the contact group. By preventing the contact between the coagulation factors and the negative surface of the wettable glass of the test tube. And that's why we call the intrinsic pathway. Look at this contact, contact activation pathway because we came in contact with the glass. Coagulation factors are classified into three main groups, fibrinogen group, prothrombin group, and contact group. Coagulation factors are classified into fibrinogen group, prothrombin group, and contact group. Okay, members of the fibrinogen group. On top, we have fibrinogen. Oh, no kidding, because it's called fibrinogen group, so it contains fibrinogen plus other stuff. It's like the Hillary Clinton campaign. Who is the first member of the campaign? Hillary Radom freaking Clinton. And then we have factor 5, factor 8, and factor 30. How do I remember this? First, it's called the fibrinogen group, so you should remember fibrinogen. This is easy. Fibrinogen is factor 1. Thank you so much. And then 5 plus 8 equals 13. You got it. Next, we have the prothrombin group. Who is the first member of the prothrombin group? Prothrombin, which is factor 2. After this, we have factor 7, factor 9, and factor 10. So, it's prothrombin... 7, 9, 10. Prothrombin, 7, 9, 10. 2, 7, 9, 10. Or you can say it's 1972. And the one here represents 10. 9, 7, 2. And this should remind you of another mnemonic, which was 1, 9, 7, 3. What was 1, 9, 7, 3? These are the cranial autonomic nerves. These are the parasympathetic nerves inside your freaking cranium. And they were 10, 973. The oculomotor is parasympathetic. 7, which is facial, has parasympathetic. 9, the glossopharyngeal, has parasympathetic. And the vague, vagus, has parasympathetic. The first group is fibrinogen group. Fibrinogen, and then 5 plus 8 equals 13. Thank you so much. It's activated by thrombin. Oh, yeah. Remember, prothrombin, which is factor 2, becomes thrombin, and then thrombin activates fibrinogen, which is factor 1, into fibrin. So to activate the fibrinogen group, the most important member here is fibrinogen, we need thrombin. Very good. All of them are formed in the liver. Oh, yeah. In addition to that, factor 13 is also formed in the megakaryocyte slash platelet. These factors are not present in the serum. Oh, yeah, because these are the members of the fibrin clot. Remember that the serum is plasma minus the clot. So these will be in the clot, leaving the serum alone. They are not present in the serum because they have been consumed in the clot. Inflammation or pregnancy or oral contraceptive pills can increase plasma level of fibrinogen. And that's why fibrinogen can be considered as an acute phase reactant. Translation. Let's say that you're trying to diagnose a patient who has a fibrinogenemia. Okay. And then you found out that the fibrinogen level in his serum was normal. A mediocre doctor will say, oh, your fibrinogen level in the serum is normal. Therefore, you do not have a fibrinogen anemia. You are such a pathetic piece of melanin because fibrinogen is an acute phase reactant. If this person had a fibrinogen anemia and another inflammation for whatever reason, the fibrinogen level will be artificially elevated, giving you the false appearance, the mirage. 
that the fibrinogen level is normal. And it's not, it's just artificially elevated because of the inflammation. If you remember, ferritin was the same thing. Ferritin could increase in your body if you have inflammation. Therefore, a normal ferritin level does not rule out iron deficiency anemia. I can be iron deficient. You expected my ferritin level to be low because I'm iron deficient, but my ferritin level came back normal. Why did it come back normal? Maybe I had an inflammation and that's why my ferritin level was artificially elevated. So please, please, please pay attention to this very important key point. Remember that von Willebrand factor is a carrier of factor 8. Von Willebrand factor will prolong the half-life and sustain factor 8 in the serum by preventing its degradation. And that's why patients with von Willebrand disease can suffer from decreased factor 8 activity and a shorter factor 8 half-life. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. The first group, fibrinogen group, is in the books. Now, it's the prothrombin group. Prothrombin, and then we have factor... 7, 9, and 10. Remember, it's 1972 all over again. Prothrombin 7, 9, 10. Prothrombin 7, 9, 10. 2, 7, 9, 10. So what's going on? All of them are formed in the liver. How? Oh, first we require vitamin K. Okay, what's the name of the process of activating these factors in the liver? It's called gamma carboxylation. Mmm, love it. What's the name of the enzyme? If it's called gamma carboxylation, the name of the enzyme is gamma glutamyl carboxylase. Amazing. What's the name of this process called gamma carboxylation? It's a subtype of post-translational modification, a huge topic in biochemistry and molecular biology. All of these are present in the serum, except there's a huge exception here, factor two, which is the prothrombin because it's necessary to become thrombin and to activate the fibrinogen into fibrin. Okay, that's impressive, but how did we activate our prothrombin group? Okay, this is the gamma glutamyl carboxylase, and this is gamma carboxylation. We need what? We need vitamin K. But vitamin K was inactive first. It was oxidized and inactive, and fat and ugly. But then came an epoxide reductase, reduced his fat by liposuction, and made it into this slim, reduced, active vitamin K. Active vitamin K is my hero, because it will stimulate gamma glutamyl carboxylase, which will activate the gamma glutamyl carboxylation, which will lead to formation of prothrombin 7, 9, and 10. Don't forget protein C, protein S, and protein Z. There's a drug that inhibits the epoxide reductase. It's called warfarin, and therefore inhibit the vitamin K-dependent gamma carboxylation of factors, prothrombin 7, 9, and 10, protein C, protein S, and protein Z. Next, we have the contact group 11 and 12, activated by contact with the subendothelial collagen, or high molecular weight kinesia, or calicrin, or plated factor 3, or the negative charges of the wet surface of the glass of the test tube. All of them are made in the liver, all of them are present in the serum. Thank you so much. Some people consider high molecular weight kinesia and calicrin as part of the contact group. I don't care. I've told you about the benefits and the functions of factor 12 before. It has bazillion functions. And we have discussed the high molecular weight kinesin in the calicrin kinin system before. Remember that calicrin can activate high molecular weight kinesin into radikinin, and it can activate factor 12 into the active form of factor 12. Blood is made of plasma and cells. Plasma is made of serum and the clotting factors. All of them? No. Just the fibrinogen group, which is fibrinogen. 5 plus 8 equals 13, and don't forget factor 2, which is prothrombin. And here is everything you need to know about the coagulation factor groups. And here is a very difficult question for you. Which of the following results on serum protein electrophoresis is expected in a patient with type 4 renal tubular acidosis? Here is the normal serum protein electrophoresis, and here are your choices. You have seven choices. Which of them can be found in a patient with type 4 RTA? Let me know the answer in the comment section. You'll find the correct answer in the next video. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. You can get my 50 hematology cases here, and you can download my antibiotics course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. Thank you so much for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.